uh, welcome everybody. Okay. <laughs> Wanted to welcome everybody out to the 2020 West Region uh, Cooperative Soul Survey Conference. Thank you so very much for participating in this virtual event as we uh, try this new format. I really do appreciate your, the time you've taken to attend uh, and to participate and learn. My name is Dr. Colby Brungard. I'm an assistant professor of pedology at New Mexico State University. Uh, behind me is a delightful Ustic Kelsey Argent from Southern New Mexico. We're going to go ahead and just move directly into the conference, into the main portion of today's conference. The program was sent out via email and you should have a copy and I encourage you to use that copy to follow along. I'm also sharing my screen, uh, which highlights today's program. Our agenda for today as follows is that we will begin shortly after my remarks, we'll begin with a brief video. After that video, we will then uh, move into the, uh, the cooperators addresses portion of our conference. We'll have uh, at the conclusion then of the cooperators addresses, we'll move to the committee meeting, committee portion of our meeting. Each of the committee meetings will be held in a separate Zoom session. So this main session that we are on right now will end. And I ask you to use your agenda to choose the links for the, uh, the committee meeting that you would like to attend. Um, one note, for those of you that registered for the interpretations committee, that, interpre that committee has been rolled into the technology committee because of overlapping discussions and interests. Because of the virtual format of today's, uh, well, or of the entire conference, each of the following presentations will be brief, but uh, depending on the length of the presentation, we may have a brief question and answer period following each speaker. If you do have a question for the speaker, please use the chat option to ask your question, and then I will be able to read the question back to the speaker. If you'd like further information about the presentation, uh, I encourage you to contact the speaker directly. Additionally, these recordings are being presented, or these presentations are being recorded and will be archived for, for future reference uh, at the National, at the Cooperative Soul Survey web, uh, conference webpage. It's hosted by the NRCS. As a brief reminder, unless you're the presenter, please turn off your mic and, and to avoid any unanticipated sounds. Uh, also, I encourage you to turn off your video unless you're the presenter uh, to improve bandwidth use. use. We're gonna go ahead and just jump in right now to begin the conference. Uh, we'll first turn to a short video that follows the theme of uses of soil survey. There are certainly um, many aspects of how soil and water conservation is supported by the Cooperative Soil Survey in states as diverse as those as found in the Western US. The following video highlights how decisions made and supported by the Cooperative Soil Survey help landowners and land managers, particularly in New Mexico. This video highlights Jim Berlier, a past president of the Soil and Water Conservation District uh, and an active rancher. Uh, you give us just a moment to make the transition to the video. for soil health and range conditions all my life. If we don't maintain the grasslands in a healthy manner and leave them better than we found them, there just won't be anything for our grandchildren and for future generations. feel a connection to this landscape. You know, when I travel as much as I do, 
When I pull back in here and cross the cattle guard, I feel like I'm home. It's just a warm feeling that the efforts that we've put forth have been worth our time. We own and operate the San Pablo Ranch here in eastern Torrance County and western Guadalupe County in New Mexico. The name San Pablo was given to this ranch by Mariano Mendoza, who was the original settler here in 1876. We call it the Berlier Ranch too, but it's also known as the San Pablo Ranch and around the neighboring area here, everybody knows where the San Pablo is. My uncle Theo Berlier, he's a great uncle, came here in 1937. I asked Theo one time, how many cattle did you run on this place? He said, oh, hell, I never did know. I just stick them in there till their tails hung over the fence. And therefore, they grazed it all. They just thought if you let a blade of grass go unharvested, that it was wasteful. I feel sustainability is the key to what we're doing here. Sustainability to me means that you can harvest this grass without doing any harm to the ecosystem. When you have a healthy plant community, you can provide more of the diet requirements for livestock from forage longer through the year and you don't have to supplemental feed as much. For ranchers, that's really one of the big output costs on their operation is having to provide supplemental feed. New Mexico has really been at the forefront of the conservation movement. We are such a fragile climate here. We're really ranching in the desert. You're not going to farm this country out here. It's too arid, too dry, can't afford to pump the water on it. But I'll tell you what, we can run cows on it and do a good job managing those. And really it raises the production level of a ranch when you start to manage them with more of a conservative thought. One of the things that got me involved in this conservation effort, I lost my son in a car wreck. It changed Jimmy, and not for the good. I was losing my mind as well as losing my son, and a good friend of mine, Kyle Sharp, decided to start dragging me to soil and water conservation meetings, and that's one way I got more involved and more active in this effort. I do think that that was a huge part of the healing. He's very passionate and he's made a difference. What Jimmy is doing here on this ranch is impacting what the neighbors are doing on their ranch. What Jimmy's doing in lending his time and knowledge to go to these different meetings, the Soil and Water Conservation District meetings, our cattle grower meetings, and, and being willing to share that knowledge, it's impacting some. It's making a difference here in New Mexico in this ranching community. When we first came here and took over, my dad and I, there was bare soil all over the place and erosion. And now we've got such a healthy plant community that when it rains, we don't have runoff like we used to. You don't get to tell Mother Nature when to rain. The one thing that you can influence one thing that you can manage is the plants. A rancher is really a grass farmer, and they're using their livestock to harvest their crop. If I'm not a steward of the land, if I don't take care of that land, I'm not going to be around here for long. I'm not going to be, certainly not in the ranching business. I guess you'd say in the older generation, Theo's generation, people didn't think much about sustainability. They were just here to harvest every blade of grass that grew and thought that was the best way to maximize their profits. But as time went on, they overgrazed this land and ate up all the cool season grasses. Now by letting it rest, we've had a lot of the cool season grasses come back. We're able to utilize that to the best of our ability and grow more beef than we did back when it was overgrazed. 
he's proud of what he's done here. He's walked the walk. He did it. He put the boots on the ground and went out there and did the work. And consequently, I know good and well that the wildlife habitat has improved on this ranch. The carrying capacity has improved on this ranch. And the long-term sustainability of this ranch has been improved. Jim has a very creative mind and he's got a lot of good ideas. He wants to leave something behind. And I'm not talking about financial gain. I'm talking about a way of life, something that is very tangible that you can see. I never did even consider spreading the word about it. I was just doing it for myself and didn't even know the avenues to spread the word. But I became more and more involved and dedicated my service to the memory of my son. I definitely think open space is healthy and healing. It's just a beautiful way of life to be able to come out here and enjoy Mother Nature and what it provides for us. Thank you for your continued participation. Our next, uh, to move on from that video, uh, talking about sustainability and the uses of the land and how Cooperative Soil Survey can support that. Our next speaker will be Matthew Lohr, Chief of the NRCS. He had a very busy schedule and, uh, oh, here he is. All right, <laughs> Mr. Lohr, we'll turn the time over to you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay, Colby? Hopefully you guys yes. can, can hear me okay. Um, what, a, what a great honor and pleasure it is to have a chance to join you for the West Region Cooperative Soil Survey Conference. Uh, I wish that we were gathering in person, but certainly understand uh, with COVID, it's caused us to change the way that we all do things. But thank goodness we have technology that we can gather together by Zoom around the computer and still be able to share. Um, I have to say it was great seeing that video with my good friend Jim earlier uh, and seeing uh, the beautiful scenes of New Mexico. I had a chance to visit with Jim earlier this year, a uh, fine, fine family, and it was just great to have a chance to, to see and hear him and see the good work that's being done. I absolutely love the West. Uh, throughout my time as chief the last two years, I've had a chance to travel across the entire country, but across the West, the Montanas, the Utahs, the Colorados, New Mexico, Wyoming, absolutely some of the most beautiful places on this wonderful earth that God has, has created for us. And so um, I'm envious of all of you here from the West that are, that are participating in here because you truly have such a beautiful part of the country that you live. And so um, thanks for, for what you do for, for soils, for, for conservation. And again, it's, it's an honor for me to have a chance to be here. I have the great uh, joy to serve as chief of uh, USDA's NRCS we're the federal agency that's part of USDA that works hand in hand with our farmers and our ranchers and our private forest land owners to help them with their conservation needs across the board through conservation planning, delivering farm bill programs, and certainly the good work that our soils folks do uh, plays into that. So it's an honor to have a chance to spend just a few minutes with you here to help kick off your conference. Um, I know Dr. Dave Limbo is, is with us here as well, who leads our soil science division and his team uh, does a great job and so we are honored to be a partner a cooperator with you in this event so for me um, i'm a fifth generation farmer uh, not from the west but from the east uh, in the Shenandoah valley of virginia and so farming is a little different than the ranches in the west but uh, one thing that is the same and that is the being able to take care and understand uh, the properties and the qualities of our soil and how we can make our soils the foundation for everything that we do 
in conservation. My earliest memories were working alongside of my, my father and grandfather, and they were instilling in me a love of conservation. I remember asking my grandfather about the different types of soil that we had on our farm and listening to his knowledge and understanding uh, just how important um, that foundation of everything that we do on the land is. Uh, I'm proud that as a farmer, we for years and years in practicing no-till, uh, making sure we have cover crops after every crop using our crop rotations, um, always making sure that we look for ways to reduce any kind of, of runoff, timely application of nutrients. I mean, if you take care of the soil, it will take care of you. So naturally, when I stepped into this role as the first farmer chief in 25 years, uh, making soil health a top priority was, was clearly one of the things that I wanted to do because it's so important um, I've seen it firsthand, and I know for all of you, it's so important what you do every single day. Uh, the importance of science-based information is truly the foundation of conservation planning um, and the practice implementation that our agency does. The soils and the ecological information are key foundational data sets for conservation agencies. And I love learning about projects like Restore New Mexico, um, you know, the partnership between NRCS and BLM, New Mexico Association of Conservation Districts and the U.S. Forest Service and others. And, and since 2005, some 15 years ago, this project has treated over 3 million acres with millions more in the planning process. Uh, the partnership, as you know, has relied upon quality soil and ecological site data that controls invasive brush species, which is so common in the western parts of the country, improving our riparian habitat, reducing woodland encroachment on rangelands and reclaiming abandoned oil and gas flow pads. So uh, this project has provided a feedback loop where on the ground results have been measured over 10 years and this information is truly reshaping our views of the ecosystem dynamics on a landscape scale. A great example of what we can accomplish when we collaborate and work together. And I have to say that during my time as chief, probably one of the greatest things that I've been able to enjoy and learn firsthand is how we all can collaborate together. Not one agency or one NGO or one group can do it alone. It takes all of our collaboration coming together and sharing in those things that we have in common. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to say congratulations to you for having such a diverse membership in the National Cooperative Soil Survey. That diversity is what makes, is what makes you great, what makes you strong. You know, in the West, ranches uh, spread across thousands of acres. As you know, multiple types of land ownership from private land to federal land to tribal land and state lands. And coming from the state of Virginia, that's not necessarily the case in the eastern part of the country. But one of my first trips about a year and a half ago out to Montana, and we're looking at a 10,000 acre ranch, and they were explaining to me about how all of these different ownerships kind of all mingle together and blend together. Uh, across the boundaries. Um, very different way that, that ranching takes place in the West, but uh, the National Cooperative Soil Survey has been able to provide leadership to ensure that the land management data, the soil and ecological data is seamless across land ownership boundaries and it's the highest quality to help all of you manage these resilient landscapes. So very exciting to see. Um, the data ensures projects such as Restore New Mexico that I just mentioned. Um, it's a checkerboard landscape but it would be impractical or impossible to treat the thousands of acres of brush if the soil and the ecological site data um, change with every type of ownership. And so this conference of the West National Cooperative Soil Survey is an example of what makes this partnership possible and successful. I know you've got presentations from the Forest Service and BLM, uh, NRCS of course, USGS and, and many universities, again, collaboration across so many lines where we can have uh, such experts coming together that all have the same core beliefs, that all have the same end goal, coming together to share is what truly makes for a success. And certainly the collaboration that each of you have with universities adds the depth and value to conservation delivery on the ground. And I love too that um, seeing increased student participation in these science-based conservation implementation certainly builds the capacity to carry conservation forward. Uh, I'm a, a dad of six kids, and I love being able to help see their love in conservation and their love in agriculture grow and foster. And as an agency, you know, we try to do that through our Pathways program where we bring in hundreds of students every year and, and show them just how important uh, the work that we do together 
uh, educating and engaging them in the critical importance of healthy soils and resilient agriculture. Highly functioning ecosystems is crucial. Um, and the agency does that through a number of approaches, including local and outreach education programs and grants and agreements. And especially, like I said, through our Pathways program, we're able to really help give our student interns a, a, a real taste of what it is that we do and hopefully inspire them to want to engage in the work that we do uh, as a career. So thank you so much uh, on behalf of NRCS for the great work that you are doing. I know that this is going to be a, a wonderful conference again, although virtual, there's nothing better than, than getting a couple hundred folks around the room and being able to share a network. But in lieu of that, being able to have this West Region Cooperative Soul Survey Conference virtually uh, will still provide a, a great resource and great benefit. So again, thanks for allowing me to share a few minutes with you. Thanks for what you do. And more importantly, thanks for letting NRCS be a partner in you as we all work uh, towards healthier soil. So thank you very much for this time to be with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Coulter. I'm the acting uh, National Souls Program Leader for the Forest Service. And I plan to give you a little uh, update on activities that the Forest Service is up to right now and a little bit of background uh, of the Forest Service for those that aren't as familiar. Uh, Starting with the, the mission of the Forest Service is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. And our motto is caring for land and serving the people. Currently, the Forest Service has 19, or nine regions, sorry, and a little over 232 million acres. And this is a map showing of where those regions are located, um, for those of you that don't know. The Forest Service uh, hiring updates, uh, the Pacific Northwest, Pacific Southwest and the Rocky Mountain regions are currently evaluating candidates for their regional soil program leaders. And so for most of you at the, the Western Conference, we will be seeing um, quite a bit of new leadership coming in within this next year of, of the Western regions. Along with that, the National Soils Program Leader, the, the position I'm detailed into right now is also uh, on the list to be filled, and we should be seeing the announcements here within the next month or so. So on forest soil moisture, the Forest Service and NRCS are exploring the use of dynamic soil properties and dynamic soil surveys uh, to better understand forest soils on how forest soils have soil moisture and climatic influence. Uh, Currently, there's a focus on two experimental research forests, Coweta and Hubbard Brook. Hubbard Brook is in Region 9, Coweta is in Region 8. Um, that fieldwork should be starting within the next year. Uh, the Forest Service is also exploring the establishment of a framework for a network of forest soil uh, moisture monitoring locations to aid management and early detection, uh, land management decisions, reforestation projects, adaptation projects, and resilience projects. Pilots are being established currently in Region 1 and Region 8. Now to give a little background on uh, terrestrial ecological unit inventory. So I wanted to talk about this for a little bit because uh, I wanted folks to see how soils fit into how we uh, look at landscapes. Um, TEUI provides a spatial context for us to understand ecological and hydrological processes, disturbance regimes, habitat and vegetation patterns, successional pathways, um, along with data collection and building of spatial models, uh, ecosystem characterization for forest planning, watershed assessments, landscape analysis, and field projects. A lot of our forest management plans are built off of uh, TEUI. And this slide is just showing the hierarchy of, of how uh, the framework fits into Forest Service management and how 
uh, soils and vegetation, and climate fits into the hierarchy. So most of our national forests work at the, the landscapes or the land units, which is the land type associations or the land types and land type phases. Now, I also want to point out here, uh, there's currently a push uh, within the Forest Service to try to get uh, land type associations mapped across all lands so that uh, we can better understand what is happening in, in the entire uh, land type association. So of course, look at Forest Service uh, soil inventory status. Currently in the, in the Western United States, there's about 160, uh, roughly 160 million acres of Forest Service land. And when you see the, the second block there, there's about 76 uh, million acres not meeting CERGO standards. However, that's a little misleading because although the database shows that, most, forests, most of those lands, there's some, something to make interpretations for management. And so that raises uh, some questions for us. And the first question is, you know, how do we prioritize uh, these acres? You know, do we pri prioritize it based on land management needs? Um, should we prioritize it uh, where there is no useful data? And lastly, do we need to make all areas meet CERGO standards? And so those are all questions that we're kind of wrestling with here. And I'm sure some of those will be discussed during the committee breakouts. The next thing is, you know, we want to help our sister agency with their push to complete initial soil survey by 2026, but our focus is, is on uh, utility for land managers, such as uh, making sure that we get a finished product as uh, with the Tresso Ecological Unit Inventory. And this is just showing what those areas look like across the Western US, the green areas are showing where uh, it, the land currently doesn't meet CERGO standards. Ways that we're looking at trying to address these needs. Uh, the first one is we've got a new uh, NCSS MOU with NRCS that ensures compliance with the uh, NCSS standards and accommodates ecological map products that better meet the uh, forest service business needs and emphasis on digital soil mapping in the next decade to fill in the holes. Uh, Geospatial Technology Application Center, DCHAC, is helping us take the lead uh, in filling in some of these holes. And I just wanted to throw this slide up to show uh, some of the joint projects that we have currently with NRCS that GTEC is, is helping do digital soil mapping with. One, one's the Bob Marshall Wilderness in Region 1, a uh, couple projects on the Boise, uh, and Payette and Humboldt Toyabe National Forest. And lastly, uh, GTEC is working on creating a, a CONUS 30 meter layer across all lands to use when modeling soil properties. Some of the challenges that we're, meet, that we're having in meeting these needs is one available staffing, as many are aware, uh, all, of our, all the government agencies have been cutting back on positions. Uh, funding priorities, we've been in a flat budget for a number of years now, and technology is continuing to change and trying to stay up with that technology, such as acquiring LIDAR to be able to, to make digital soil mapping uh, more efficient. And so with that, um, I'll open up to any questions. Thanks. All right, uh, hearing no questions, we're not seeing any questions. I guess I'm next. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Ron McCormick. I'm with the uh, headquarters office of Bureau of Land Management. Um, recently relocated to Portland. Um, as part of that uh, reorganization, relocation for the BLM, we uh, the, the 200 level science uh, natural resources division um, started originally started out with about 220 people uh, total uh, through attrition and uh, uh, hiring freeze. We were down to about 160 people in the uh, uh, Washington office. Um, 
with the move and reorganization, we lost uh, over 100 people out of that group. And right now, uh, the national office only has 65 um, active people spread across 12 different offices from uh, basically from Santa Fe through Boise, Portland. Uh, a number went to the state office in Denver and uh, a few other uh, smaller state offices. Um, so yes, same, same as the Forest Service. If you know somebody that's looking for a job, we certainly have a lot of openings. Um, the uh, soil survey work continues as always through our uh, state district and uh, field offices. Uh, primarily the most work being done is in uh, Oregon, uh, Nevada, uh, some in Wyoming, uh, Southern California, and then of course Alaska, um, which I didn't get an update from uh, Eric Geisler, but uh, I know he's probably out in the field trying to get some of that work done. Um, probably the biggest thing that we're trying to get done this year um, is developing workflows that will integrate uh, ecological sites and, and uh, edit information into BLM decision-making processes. Um, it's, it's something that we are trying to do in a, a number of different uh, avenues, just trying to have um, a better handle on what science we're quoting when we're doing planning and also have something that we can point back to and say, here's what we used when we made decisions. Um, Emily Kachurgis um, out of Denver is, is heading that initiative. Um, a couple of other people with BLM and then uh, some of the ARS folks down in uh, Santa Fe, or sorry, Las Cruces, um, are also gonna help us out with that. Um, part of it links with um, trend, as the, as the ESDs are migrating into edit, uh, what we're trying to do is through that process, use uh, assessment inventory and monitoring AIM data from uh, all of our terrestrial work that we've been doing over uh, five plus years now uh, and have a, a huge number of points that have very good detailed inf information on um, vegetation and soils uh, combined with that. We hope we can use that to um, sort of develop an approach for how to use those AIM data in, in sort of confirming or, or better uh, refining um, both ecological site and uh, state and transition model, model concepts. So um, the end point of this whole thing is um, the, the soil survey work will always continue and just is, is cooperative locally. Nationally, what we're trying to do is, is improve um, and set up a framework for the use of those data as they start coming in. So um, that's pretty much my job at this point. Um, I'm being converted from the national ecologist to the national soil scientist as, as part of the move to Portland. So um, that's really a brief update. Um, if there are other questions or if you uh, have uh, any, any more information you want to know about the project, just uh, let me know. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. Let's wait a minute or so for any additional questions to see if any pop up in the group chat. Uh, Kobe, there is a question for uh, Robert Coulter um, that Daniel asked, if you want to have time for that. Sure, we have a, a minute or two in our, in our schedule. Um, there was a question for Robert, anything about uh, in the chat window about uh, anything to speed, uh, any, well, the question is, I'm curious if anything can be done to speed up the permit process for the Forest Service. Apparently it takes about six months to process a permit. Yes, hi. Yeah, I was uh, talking with Daniel um, oh, you were, privately to get, a, to get a little more uh, um, background on his question there for which kind of permit that he was looking for. He's looking for a special use permit for digging and sampling soils. Um, 
those permits are normally conducted at the at the field level, so at the individual forests, and and each each one of those goes through different types of um, review depending on what the circumstances may be. And soils are one of those that takes a little bit more time, especially if you're dealing with uh, cultural uh, culturally sensitive areas that they need to be uh, reviewed to make sure that sites aren't going to be disturbed and that sort of thing. Um, the the best answer I can uh, give you in, in the in the process is to reach out to the local soil scientists uh, on the forest and whether that's at the at the supervisor's office level the forest soil scientists or the district soil scientists because they they would be the best contact and the best person to work with uh, to help move the process along. Wonderful thank you so much. Uh, there's a question for Ron. Uh, what kind of education level is the BLM looking for for the for the open positions that you mentioned? Ah, um, well, it's it's probably a mix. Um, I think the minimum for most um, uh, headquarters are uh, a bachelor's with a certain number of hours in whatever the discipline is, whether it's fisheries, hydrology, plants. Um, so that's that's just the minimum, but there's um, every, every level of education you can think of in the staff. And mostly what we're looking for is uh, what experience do you have? And um, yeah, what, what would you help bring to our organization? Um, thankfully, they don't let me uh, do any of the hiring, so I can't give you too much more information than that. But um, the minimum is at least a bachelor's, but other than that, I don't think there is much requirement. Great, thank you so much. Okay. Let's, uh, seeing no other questions at the moment, let's move on to our next presenter. All right, hello everybody. Get my screen sorted out here. <clears throat> All right, I think I got all the buttons pushed now. <laughs> all right, so um, thanks again, everybody. Um, I'm, my name is Jason Kenworthy. I'm the Geologic Resources Inventory Coordinator uh, for the National Park Service, uh, part of the Geologic Resources Division. Um, we're, we're a national, so a Washington level office, um, but are based uh, here in Colorado. Um, and our task briefly is to provide that geoscience-based uh, technical policy and administrative support uh, to parks and other offices um, all across the uh, National Park Service. So our division oversees uh, two of the 12 uh, fundamental natural resource inventories uh, that are part of the inventory monitoring program. Uh, that's the Geologic Resources Inventory, or GRI, and the Soil Resources Inventory, or SRI. Um, you can see the full list of 12 should be on your screen right now. Um, the sibling inventories, GRI and SRI, uh, both provide uh, that GIS data, maps, and uh, resource management information to each of the more than 270 parks uh, that are part of the INM program. Uh, since late 90s, uh, the SRI has partnered with NRCS to fund uh, Sergo quality or Sergo level mapping um, in parks across the country. And um, many of you have either worked on those projects or are familiar with them. And some of you I know are working on those uh, projects for us right now. Um, just a brief bit of history to kind of give some context for where we are right now. Um, in December of 2013, a longtime SRI coordinator, Pete Bigham, retired, um, and the, the program staff that he had, uh, their agreement was, um, was not renewed. So the, the program was, was scaled way back and then moved under the administrative purview of the uh, GRI. Um, and then we ran into all kinds of uh, exceptional contracting stumbling blocks. Um, I will spare you the gory details. <laughs> um, and we ended up adopting a, a no new start policy till we can kind of figure out what was going on. Um, at that time, there were 234 parks that were considered complete. Uh, another dozen were in the works, uh, leaving uh, two dozen parks that had really no plan for, for a soils map. And uh, soils then just languished at the national level um, in, our, in our office. We, didn't have the, the capacity or the folks uh, to really um, sustain that program more than just beyond uh, the basic administrivia and working on getting agreements um, set up to keep the, the four final first generation products running. And we'll see where those parts are here in just a second. 
All right, so we're going to fast forward to 2019, and uh, two things happened that year that, that really are relevant to where we are now and where we're headed in the future. Uh, first, uh, we welcomed NRCS, uh, at the time, uh, Presidential Management Fellow John Andrioni, that's him on the left, um, into our office for a six-month uh, rotation. And second, uh, the Park Service Inventories 2.0 plan was released, and that's it there on the right. So having... Um, Having John's uh, focused energy knowledge really helped us uh, suss out what data we did already have, uh, what was in Web Soil Survey, what park specific manuscripts existed, and connected us to many of you, the NRCS folks um, that are doing the work on the ground, and helped uh, show us in the National Office what soils can do for soil information can do for the Park Service. Now, of course, all of this was uh, previously known by uh, the Park Service and the SRI staff, but once uh, we lost those positions and weren't able to backfill them, you know, as as we've heard, uh, we just lost that capacity and that institutional knowledge. So it's been really good to try and get some, to get some of that back here in the next few years. Um, in March 2019, uh, pre-John, we were still using the numbers that you see on the screen here um, that we had been using for a number of years. We knew there were about 234 parks that had data, eight were in progress that didn't need any more money, four more were in progress with active um, funding agreements. And um, all four of those are here in the, the Western region. You can see Mojave National Preserve in California, Sequoia Kings Canyon National Parks in California, uh, Olympic National Park up in the Northwest in Washington and Zion National Park um, in Utah. So again, we had about two dozen parks that really didn't have uh, an effective plan. And you see those as the green dots on the slide. <clears throat> so it turns out after some sleuthing, um, again, led by, led by John for the most part, um, the Park Service really has, actually does have Sergo level data in Web Soil Survey or uh, appropriate for Alaska scale data for 248 parks. Um, and we have the same four parks that are in, in progress. We actually have some fresh funding agreements that have been signed in the last two years to keep those going. Uh, hopefully uh, for the duration of the, the five year agreements uh, without stopping and starting like we had in the past. And as you can see more than half of the now 13 quote unquote no plan parks have at least partial coverage already. So we're, we're really in a much better spot than we thought. Uh, we're gonna shift focus here to the um, Western region. And that totals 127 of our more than 270 parks in the INM program. Of those 109 already are considered complete um, or have data in web soil survey or are complete by Alaska standards. Um, all of the in progress parks um, are here in the Western region and 12 of the 13 parks um, with some variety of some data or not sure yet um, are also here in the West. Now, what's pretty cool with uh, 2026 in mind and the goal to have those uh, soil surveys done is that aside from uh, Death Valley, which of course is a pretty big uh, asterisk, um, all five of the, what we would consider the no data, no plan, or what you might consider a not com parks are actually relatively um, small. So we've really uh, gained a lot of um, knowledge about what's available to us just in the last year. And the kind of the, the second big ticket item, um, so to speak, from 2019 was the release of the inventories 2.0 plan. This is the second generation of Park Service natural resource inventories. Um, and, it, and you can see on your screen now, this is the, the framework for the 10 inventories that are going to be covered under um, uh, 2.0. And you may notice some similarities with 1.0. We'll get into that here in just a second. So. Um, even though both soils and geology um, were in theory, you know, quote unquote, covered by first generation products uh, through the existing one, uh, SRI and GRI programs, inventories 2.0 includes, um, and I'm going to quote here, uh, maps of geologically recent management relevant surficial units that include surficial geology and soils information. So in short, uh, soils maps and surficial geology maps. So although that may appear um, that we're just starting over again and redoing things, it's actually we're taking a different uh, tact here. Uh, following a few years of scoping discussions across the service, um, many, many folks at different levels in the agency said that uh, the 1.0 data, both from SRI and GRI, just, just wasn't meeting their needs. Um, on, the, on the soil side, likely that was um, due to the fact that you know, those us in the national office, we really had no outreach to the parks and weren't able to provide any assistance to them for, you know, more than half, um, half a decade. So we weren't there to help, kind of help keep that, um, that momentum going with using that soils data. And the other piece of that, I think, is that, you know, the whole point of the 1.0 
data exercise was that we were providing just baseline data. Every park got a, a map. The idea was to provide that information for the entirety of each park. So, you know, all within the green lines. And so every park was given more or less a standardized product um, and, a, and a suite of tools to analyze that with. So a lot of the onus was put on the park managers to then use that data to, to make a decision and figure out how to analyze that data to get information to make a decision. So the, the second generation here really aims to build um, on that baseline that we've got here in um, 1.0 already. So like I, like I mentioned, and like you've already heard from the Forest Service and BLM, we're really trying to distill our data to something that's um, more specific for decision makers to actually use science to make those um, decisions. And the, what's interesting about the, the 2.0 products is that they don't necessarily have to cover an entire park like the 1.0 did. Um, they can focus on particular management areas, corridors, or even individual um, uh, management significant uh, projects in a particular park. Something that's also going to be a shift for us in the park service um, is that they also have to be a relatively short-lived project. Um, INM is hoping to fund these uh, for about two years and in the order of magnitude of about $100,000. So that's, that's a lot different than the way we've done things um, in the past. Now, what's also um, interesting about the new approach here is that we're not requiring, um, again, since we're not trying to cover the whole park, we aren't requiring new field work or data collection if that's not what's actually needed to answer a park's uh, most pressing questions. So we're hopeful that some of that funding can also be used to, um, for training um, on, on folks on how to use existing tools. Uh, Web Soil Survey and your soil interpretations are a great example of that. Also how to um, use other means of data analysis, integration, and visualization so that folks can change that data into information. On the screen, you can see one soil interpretation example that John compiled with help from uh, Bob Dobos uh, regarding valley fever habitats uh, susceptibility in the Western, the Western region. Um, it also, you can see that, you know, because we're analyzing the data, um, you know, the numbers behind the data, we can shift some of the variables and uh, we're able to show what the suitability index would change um, using uh, a two degree, um, two degree warming. In theory, that's actually animating, but it might not be. Um, and we've actually been in contact with uh, public health specialists here in the Park Service on how best to use and release this information um, uh, to the parks. So to further test drive this concept, uh, John and I um, sat down and we, we poured through a lot of the data that were already available. And we looked at five parks that already had these kind of dedicated um, surficial maps and surgo quality data. Um, and we chose, chose five that kind of fit the bill here. But we're also looking at five that, that were different kinds of parks. Um, and so here you can see them on the screen. Two are in the Western region, Mount Rainier and Glacier. And we really were looking for a variety of parks, uh, small, medium, large, you know, vast natural parks with a lot of wilderness areas to parks that are more urban or um, uh, suburban. We're also looking for parks that have different types of processes, different connections to people, different management needs. And one thing that was really interesting here is that we found, you know, two of these five had focused agriculture programs that are part of their historic landscape management um, activities. And so they were really interested to see what soils data uh, could do from them from, you know, what would be considered, I guess, quote unquote, more a traditional use of, uh, of NRCS data. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, we had compiled data and hosted conference calls with um, four of these five parks, and we're trying to wrap up the data gathering and synthesis phase um, uh, this year. And we're really trying to listen to parks to see what their specific needs are, and if we can meet those with existing 1.0 data, or what the next steps might be in 2.0 to fill those data gaps at these parks or at other parks that don't have, um, that have less complete data than these, what we're calling the, the Fab Five. So what does a 2.0 soils and superficial geology product look like? Um, well, I'm not gonna unveil it on the next screen because we don't know yet. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be able to give you a presentation on that um, next year with a little more, um, uh, con some concrete uh, products and, and processes. So what is an art plate from, for this upcoming year? Um, we're going to continue as we have been to fund uh, the park service side of supporting the NRCS field work that's going on in those four um, in, in progress parks. So this helps fund uh, compliance um, also with um, some of the, the pack supplies and mules to get, to get folks and supplies out into, um, into these parks. So we're gonna continue to fund that for the duration of the agreements. 
We also um, really want to reconnect uh, with our parks about the data that already do exist. We want better links between our internal park service information repository and uh, web soil survey to take advantage of web soil surveys annual um, update cycle. Um, the data that we provided to the parks in the past has been static um, on a you know DVD um, or a zip file um, and so we want to have those links back to web soil survey as the authoritative source. So we're working on how to best do that. And we just want to check back in with folks and let them know what's out there um, and um, that uh, we now have some momentum on, on using soils and parks. Um, we really need to finish up our proposal and science plan uh, for uh, 2.0 so we can actually, um, you know, start to test drive some of those uh, products and processes and figure out how we're going to um, receive and um, rank the proposals that, and projects that come in from the parks. And uh, the last thing that we're going to work on um, is something that we, we're closing in on the, the hopefully the home stretch here. And you, you heard this from the um, Forest Service folks as well and BLM is that we're working on a new MOU uh, to align the Park Service um, with those partnerships that are set up in some of our other our sibling land management agencies. Our goal again, facilitate future work, uh, make things easier to get done, um, such as 2.0 products, but also uh, to look more at this collaborative uh, technical assistance. The, the Park Service is clearly, um, soils are a critical resource and we just don't have the expertise in-house um, and that's where y'all come in. We've long relied on the NRCS to be our, you know, basically the, the brains behind the, the soils management um, here in the Park Service. And so we're looking for ways to, to continue that and make it um, more straightforward for parks to know that they can, um, how to reach out to folks and how we can, how we can help them find uh, the best um, solution for whatever their particular issue is. So um, that's it for me. If you have any comments or questions, uh, feel free to let me know. My contact information is up here and we'll definitely send that out as well. Um, all of our inventory products, um, all of the GRI ones are, are available right now on what we call our Geodiversity Atlas. It's a park, park by park based um, portal to access uh, ge geoscience information. And we've got most of the SRI products um, up there. We're still working on, um, again, building some of those links and I'm um, fleshing um, that out a bit. But uh, let me know if you have any questions and thank you so much for your time. It's really been great to uh, get engaged with uh, Soil's work and we really appreciate the time and energy uh, from, from NRCS. Um, Y'all are awesome and we appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. There You're is welcome. one question. It, it, the question asked from Ryan, is there a plan for getting more funding to increase the Soil's coverage when management needs at different parks change? Yes, ish. That's <laughs> so. That's um. What what we're going to be looking at is you know we want this program, 2.0 to be a little more dynamic and able to respond to requests as they come in and as management um, priorities change. So, um, I think under 1.0 the answer was no. You already got one. You can't have any more. <laughs> so under 2.0 we're going to try and be a little more flexible. Um, how that works in practice we haven't determined yet, but. We'd like to see that for sure. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Sure. All right, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Sweet. Um, so I'm Travis Salmon. Um, I am a one of the very few soil scientists in the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, I'm based out of Moab, Utah. And so I'm going to be giving the U.S. Geological Survey update for their Cooperative Soil Survey Conference here. Um, so PowerPoint to go for it. All right, sweet. So I want to give you guys a brief overview of just the USGS. We're kind of uh, administered in two ways, uh, one by our mission areas, and then we also have administration at the regional level. And so we're kind of an amorphous agency, and I kind of wanted to just go over some of what we do so that um, we haven't, USGS, USGS hasn't been that involved in the Cooperative Soil Survey, and kind of one of my goals is to change that. Um, and so we kind of have these different missionaries. We have our core science systems, which is kind of our 
our origins and our bread and butter, the topographic mapping and geologic mapping. That was kind of our the early stages of the USGS. You know, we've been around since 1879. So um, things have evolved considerably since then. Uh, we have the ecosystems mission branch, which is where I'm located. Uh, we focus a lot on kind of ecology, natural resources, wildlife science. We have an energy and minerals division, which is pretty self-explanatory, focused on geologic mapping um, and extraction analysis of kind of trends in extraction. We have an environmental health division that looks at contaminant science and kind of related issues. A land resources mission area that is kind of where primarily most of our remote sensing applications are, like arrows and some climate stuff. We have a natural hazards division with a seismic nets network, do a lot of analysis on landslide risk and coastal risk. And then I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the water resources mission area, which is, you know, manages the stream gauge network and a lot of other um, kind of water related inventory stuff. And one thing I, I think I'd like to highlight to the group is just that, you know, the USGS is kind of angled itself into being kind of the DOI, the Department of Interior kind of science consultant, so to speak. And so we, I, I would encourage kind of people thinking about, you know, obviously the USGS mission kind of overlaps a lot with the Cooperative Soil Survey in some ways um, that we kind of have a, an angle to be able to get work done kind of more on that kind of research and development side of things where there's kind of angles that may not fall kind of within the scope of some of the other agencies. And so, you know, we do a lot of work with the BLM and Park Service um, because it's easier in the DOI, but that's kind of uh, a lot of how the USGS kind of positions itself. And so I'm going to kind of focus more on, you know, some of the, a little bit of bias or stuff that I'm involved with and, and know about, but so I'm definitely not giving an exhaustive um, overview of, of the USGS in the West, but um, one of the things that I've been pretty involved with is digital soil mapping and the um, Cooperative Soil Survey um, Digital Soil Mapping Focus Team. We've been uh, working a lot on um, kind of coming up with new workflows for soil property mapping. Um, in our office, we have a, a, an agreement with the BLM kind of creating ecological site groups and kind of new um, ways to kind of process ecological data and present it. We have a kind of a push where we're looking at automated ways to kind of compare um, areas that have been received a treatment or disturbed with kind of um, nearby um, appropriate controls. The, the automated reference tool set is what we call that. We've done a lot of work in kind of salinity assessment and we have a couple different projects related to the soil interpretations in particular in collaboration with Colby Brungard. Um, and we just have a lot of broad kind of projects that are related to ecological restoration, particularly in drylands where we don't really uh, have a great understanding of what works and what doesn't. Um, do a lot of work with climate change, land use, and drought, and thinking about systematics. Um, so these are kind of a lot of things that um, we've been involved with in kind of the, particularly the Southwest. Um, to kind of dabble into that, we've uh, recently published a paper kind of coming up with a new workflow for producing soil property maps at a 30 meter resolution um, through a BLM funded uh, pilot project in the Upper Colorado River Basin. It's kind of a laundry list of the soil properties that we included in that pilot um, that were kind of particular, particularly uh, geared at uh, kind of BLM needs and some of their uh, definitions of sensitive soils. Um, so that we just published that paper and kind of working to kind of pick and choose what worked and what didn't in this and, and apply it to the digital soil mapping focus team. Um, Kind of another push that's um, a similar BLM funded project was kind of repackaging the ecological site information at kind of a coarser thematic um, scale that uh, is kind of more appropriate for more regional level decisions. And so we've been working in particular with, um, with the Colorado State Office of the BLM and the National Operations Center in Denver to kind of uh, pilot this stuff. So this is kind of, we've looked through all the existing ESDs and kind of the upper Colorado River watershed area and are kind of creating a, a kind of two tiered system with a, um, underlying soil geomorphic units that we can map pretty well using predictive methods and then optimizing how we break up the climate according to looking at uh, community reference data, and STM data, and we're also bringing in a bunch of the plot data 
uh, such as like the, the AIM data that Ron mentioned earlier um, to really kind of uh, better understand kind of the, some of the systematics of ecological potential that kind of underlie the ecological site system that has already been developed. Uh, another kind of cool related stuff is, that I mentioned is the automated reference tool set. So this is kind of basically a geospatial way to utilize um, some of the amazing satellite imagery that we have available to us. You know, the Landsat archive goes back, you know, 30, 40 years. And so we're trying to figure out ways to kind of do automated um, analysis of what works and what doesn't um, using those data sources. And so we've kind of dabbled in the social sciences to look at uh, this uh, body of literature called synthetic controls to be able to streamline kind of that um, analytical process. Um, the USGS just has an amazing array of ecological restoration programs. Um, just out of our office, we have a, a broad set of um, kind of experimental projects looking at soil amendments, looking at seed mixes, looking at con connectivity modifiers to create microsites, um, because it's really hard to restore dry land ecosystems. And so this is, you know, great. The science coming out of this is great for thinking about steam transition models and, and what is going to work in the future, because we have a lot of areas um, and when you look at the literature that, that aren't really up to specs when we think about the potential um, from an ecological perspective. Um, we also do a lot of climate, um, climate change and drought uh, manipulation studies in the USGS. Uh, we have a lot of um, drought experiments going on where we're either reducing rain or increasing temperatures and trying to understand what happens when, you know, what's gonna happen as climate change moves forward. And there's a lot, we have a lot of expertise in soil moisture modeling, John Bradford and, um, and company and Flagstaff have worked with a lot of NRCS folks and you kind of really cool paper they published last year in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution, looking at how soil moisture regimes are gonna change moving forward. We have some eco-hydrological observational studies going with the, the National Park Service around here. So there's all kinds of interesting science trying to figure out, you know, we have all this change happening around us, you know, what what does that mean um, for land managers? Um, and another cool project that we just started in uh, collaboration with New Mexico State University, Utah State and Duke um, is trying to, um, to kind of bridge um, the WRF our system model um, through some NASA, new NASA funding to really understand dust and water resources and how drought and land use are interacting with kind of some of the new understanding we have about how accelerated snowmelt is changing our water resources in the Southwest um, and trying to tease out the um, drivers of drought versus land use and how that all comes together by um, improving the WRF uh, Earth system model. So this is kind of a flavor, just a little flavor of what the USDA is. It really is a pretty amazing agency thinking about all the science that happens. And so if any of these kind of ideas have piqued your interest and you want me to point you in direction of, of how to get, get more information or get connected or collaborate, uh, feel free to just get in touch with me. And you know, if it's something that I have expertise on, I'll, I'll provide that or I can point you towards somebody that does. So really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you guys and uh, just thank Colby and New Mexico State and uh, the Cooperative Soil Survey for, for having me. Thanks. Thank you, Travis. Let's wait a minute or two to see if any questions come in. Well, seeing no questions uh, as of yet, we'll, this concludes the main session of today's meeting. I wanna thank all of the presenters for the time and effort that you've put into preparing your slides. It was very interesting uh, and, and to learn what everybody's doing about soils. I hadn't quite realized the scope of the soils work that is going on in, in our region and among different federal agencies. So as I said, this ends, this concludes uh, today's main session. 
each of the individual committees will be held in a separate Zoom session. And this current main session will end in, a, in about three minutes. Links to each of the relevant committee meetings can be found in the email with the agenda that you received um, that, that, are, that lists the program. And so I invite you to look at the link to join your, uh, join your respective session of choice. I will go ahead and put up the agenda again on this side uh, in case you need it. But uh, with that, thank you all very much. This will conclude the main portion. When the committee session that you attend is, is over, the conference will be adjourned for the day, and we will see you all again tomorrow for the field trip portion of our conference.